Good morning. My name is Dr. Eric Toring. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. The webinar today is sponsored by the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine and our partner organizations, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, the National Association of Food Federal Veterinarians, the U.S. Animal Health Association, and the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Kayla Neal grew up in central Pennsylvania and obtained her bachelor's in animal science sciences from Penn State University in 2015. She then attended Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where she obtained her DVM and master's in food safety in 2019. Upon graduation, she moved to Central Iowa to work as a production and regulatory veterinarian for Highline International, a primary layer breeder company. She then moved back to the state to State College, Pennsylvania, in July 2022 to start her current role as an assistant clinical professor in the avian diagnostics and, out and an avian diagnostics and outreach veterinarian at the Penn State University Animal Diagnostic Lab. Her major responsibilities include working up avian necropsy cases that are submitted to the lab and outreach and extension activities, such as field visits to both small, backyard, and commercial farms. Welcome, Dr. Neal, and I will let you take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you to uh, both ACVPM and um, the Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians for having me speak here today. Uh, I did want to turn my camera on just for a brief moment in, in case uh, I'm sure there are many in the audience who don't know me, so just so you can put a face to the name, but I'm going to turn it off here just to save on bandwidth so that hopefully we don't get disconnected. Our uh, Wi-Fi is not great out here. So um, I was asked to discuss um, biosecurity in the poultry industry, and I think we can all agree that this is a, a really important topic, and it is an essentially a never-ending discussion. Uh, it's something that seems to get even more important as these days go by. Uh, and so uh, so I was asked here to talk uh, at this webinar, and then um, I will also be presenting this, you know, the same topic and, and presentation at uh, the AVMA convention coming up, and then at USAHA as well. So hopefully we can connect at one of those meetings if you all will be attending there. But um, here today, uh, I think a lot of the things we'll cover maybe should be common sense um, or things that, that we really should already all know. But obviously, it's really important that we continue to discuss these things and continue to work with our clients um, and veterinarians on, on these topics. And I think my previous experience in a layer breeder company with very strict biosecurity uh, has shown that a lot of these biosecurity measures work and that they're really important. And so, you know, just from my previous experience, we would rarely break with a disease. Uh, and when we did, we could almost always trace it back to a, a pretty specific break in biosecurity. So, you know, and, and to date, knock on wood, my my former company hasn't broke with HPAI or, or had any, you know, truly terrible disease outbreaks happen. So I think it does just show that biosecurity is essential and it works. And it's really one of the, the only tools that we have in the poultry industry. So I'm excited to be here to to talk about that and kind of share my experience and, and some recommendations that I have um, based on that experience. And so to give you a little bit of an outline of what we'll cover today, I'll try to talk for about 45 minutes and then at the end we should have some time for questions, hopefully. Uh, and I'm sure everybody in this group could define biosecurity, but you know, first I think it's important to, to do that. So we'll talk about the definition of biosecurity, uh, some biosecurity 101 as it relates you know, directly to the poultry industry. And then we'll kind of talk about why we really should care about this, which again, I think everybody in this audience knows why um, we should care about biosecurity and continue to promote good biosecurity practices. But I think it is important to remind ourselves too when it when it gets tough that this is why we really need to focus on this. Uh, next, we'll go through some general and basic yet effective recommendations regarding biosecurity that our clients or producers could implement on their farms. And in, in doing so, I, this, this presentation is kind of prepared for a variety of audience. So uh, I'm assuming that this audience is probably a mix of, you know, maybe there, maybe there are some private practitioners in here, but I'm imagining that there are other, you know, like state or federal officials or other individuals working in public health or food safety areas that, um, you know, maybe... Some of you would work with smaller backyard type flock producers, others maybe more on the commercial side, but uh, so I'll, I'll try to talk a, a little bit about all areas of the industry there. 
Uh, and then as well as, you know, if, if you are working in private practice and um, so not only recommendations for clients, producers, but then considerations for veterinarians or clinics that might be seeing birds uh, either in the clinic or potentially doing flock visits, whether that is, um, you know, truly from like the veterinary client patient standpoint, or if it's, you know, visiting flocks um, from a government type role or, or things like of that nature. So that's what we'll try to get through today. So the first thing uh, is to talk about, you know, what is biosecurity? Um, and again, I think everybody here should know these things, but uh, this is everything that we do to reduce the risk of introducing disease into a flock. And it can be broken down into a few different pieces, uh, conceptual, structural, and operational. And that conceptual biosecurity is a much bigger picture. So this is the actual physical location of a poultry facility. And if we're talking about small or backyard type flocks, you know, a lot of times they don't necessarily have say in where they put their birds. Typically it's in their backyard where they live. Uh, but if we're thinking about larger commercial settings, uh, ideally if, if we're planning to build a new barn or make a new addition or something like that, uh, we definitely take a look at everything that's around that possible location and make sure that it's as well isolated as it possibly can be. Uh, especially, you know, away from other poultry facilities. But now we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, maybe from away from other livestock facilities as well, just as physically separated as it can be. Structural biosecurity would be any measures that are used in that physical construction and maintenance of those actual physical structures. So things in smaller backyard flock type settings like coops or pens, um, other smaller family farms. But then, of course, if we're talking about commercial farms, those large buildings that house all of those birds, uh, any gates or fences or anything to help keep the property secure. And then lastly, operational biosecurity, which would include any of the practices, procedures, or policies that are in place um, to keep that location uh, biosecure and, and free of disease. And, you know, it, it is often a harder sell for smaller backyard flocks to actually have this, this type of biosecurity in mind, but it's really important regardless of the type of poultry um, practice or housing or, or whatever that we're talking about. And the general goal is to keep that outside out and inside in. So, of course, we definitely don't want to underestimate biosecurity. And in the poultry industry, it's really the biggest, you know, and most important tool we have, especially considering we don't have a lot of treatment options if uh, birds do become infected with a viral or a bacterial disease, really. And so just some biosecurity 101 that goes along with that, to keep diseases out of a poultry facility, there are a few things that we really have to do no matter what. And that means keeping visitors to a minimum whenever possible, washing hands before and after handling birds, changing into dedicated shoes and clothing. And again, some of this is probably a harder sell for smaller backyard flocks, but it is really essential that we're not wearing the same shoes or clothing from, you know, that we wore out to the store or shops or wherever. Uh, back to our farm or back to our birds, adequately cleaning, disinfecting tools and equipment, monitoring for signs of illness, reporting sick birds. And of course, again, when we're, when we're thinking about some of these different sites or even large commercial sites that might have, you know, different species, not just birds, but cattle or goats or whatever, it becomes trickier with these multi-age, multi-species flocks. So these are just, you know, the basic bulletins here, um, but we'll definitely talk about each of these in, in some more detail as we go along. And so when we're specifically thinking about possible infection routes for birds, um, this goes back to those, those basic points and why we care about those basic points are because there are a number of possible infection routes. Uh, and this could be said for other animal species too, of course, but obviously feed water. Um, we want to make sure we're cleaning up, picking up dead birds as often as possible. Uh, how are we getting rid of manure? Vehicles, equipment, are they being disinfected appropriately? Uh, air is a possible infection route, although it's it's much less likely and we obviously don't have as much control over that. So we really want to focus on these other points where we have a significant amount of control. So keeping visitors down, making sure workers are all up to speed on all of the appropriate biosecurity protocols, um, keeping cats and dogs, rodents, other pests away from, from birds in the site as much as possible, obviously wild birds and insects. So, you know, if I had to give I was only able to give two slides. Those are the two slides I would give on Biosecurity 101, uh, but we'll get into some specific recommendations about each of these aspects as we go. 
But why should we care about this? Why are we here talking about this today um, and probably always and into the future and forever? And um, obviously the biggest reason we need to practice biosecurity and help our clients and producers understand why and, and that they should practice biosecurity is really no surprise to any of us here. Uh, it's to prevent high consequence diseases. And in poultry, high consequence diseases um, that we typically think about are virulent Newcastle disease and of course, avian influenza, which we can't get through a poultry talk right now without talking about avian influenza. But I first wanted to remind everybody um, of the, you know, still somewhat recent virulent Newcastle disease outbreak that happened in California from 2018 to 2019. Uh, and you'll see in this presentation, I did get a little QR code happy as well, but I feel that's sometimes easier. Um, if you want to visit this QR code, um, the California Department of Ag has this great map that shows how that outbreak spread through the state. Uh, and it'll give you some more detail on, on this outbreak and what happened. But for those who might not be aware, um, there was a, a really large outbreak of virulent Newcastle disease, and it was thought to be linked back to movement of illegal fighting cocks um, between, you know, well, within the state of California and then between Mexico and California. And it did take, you know, the state of California a while to get it, to get it under control. Um, and it was for several reasons, but one was that the bird owners were pretty distrustful of the government and, and some of these biosecurity recommendations. Uh, and so once they did get that under control, it, it took a lot of work um, from their department and, and some extension services to get the appropriate biosecurity materials and, and education out to these people to get this outbreak stamped out. And so, you know, again, there's no cure for these viral diseases in poultry. So we really have to rely on stamping out of the disease once it's there, which is why ideally we, we, you know, prefer to rely on biosecurity and prevent introduction of these diseases instead. And so, yes, right now, obviously, we're dealing with highly pathogenic avian influenza here uh, and around the world. And, and this has been going on since 2022. And, and of course, it's, it's very similar to virulent Newcastle disease. And so if you scan this code, um, it'll take you to the USDA dashboard, which is where on the next several slides, we'll kind of go through these maps and, and the current situation and what's going on there. But here you can see that essentially all states have been affected by HPAI since the start of this outbreak in 2022. And just as a refresher, the first detection of HPAI in the U.S. was in wild birds that were sampled at the end of December 21. But this result wasn't reported until January 22. The following month, uh, some commercial turkeys were affected in Indiana, and then it continued to spread from there. And then obviously more than two years later, uh, cases are still being announced quite regularly. And, you know, I think you can see down here that we have now reached over 90 million birds have been affected. Uh, and USDA uh, recent estimates per Dr. Sifford are that the outbreak efforts have cost about $1.6 billion to date. Uh, epidemiologists had determined that the outbreak uh, in this case, which is different from what happened in 2015, uh, has been a lot of um, point source introductions and spillover from wild birds. So approximately 80% of these cases have been point source introductions and as as opposed to lateral spread from you know a contaminated premises to another. So in other words, um, people or fomites are what have likely walked this virus onto these farms um, in, in at least 80% of the cases. And so that does show that you know we, we still have a lot to learn and to talk about when it comes to biosecurity to prevent introduction of this disease. And as I mentioned, this is still different than what had happened in the 2015 outbreak. And, and so uh, in this case, um, we're, we're seeing, or at least the beginning of this outbreak, we were seeing a lot of detections in wild birds. Uh, and so that's the map on the left that just shows the, the number of detections that we've had since the beginning of this outbreak in each state. Uh, and then the other map shows the number of detections within the last 30 days. And so uh, we are optimistic that it seems that the positives in wild birds are going down, um, but essentially all states have had wild birds test positive and it just shows that, that this virus is out there and it is in the environment. It's very widespread uh, and these wild birds and point source introductions into our flocks are still uh, a really big concern. And as well with, with this outbreak that we didn't necessarily see in 2015 uh, is that we have to be concerned about potential spillover into mammals. Uh, and so this map shows the wide range of, of wild mammals that have tested positive for HPII in this outbreak. Most of them are carnivorous and likely preyed upon dead and infected waterfowl. 
And mammals typically present uh, neurologically, but some may have some respiratory disease. Uh, so we're, why this is really important to us is that if we do have, you know, wild mammals on premises, they, they could potentially be a source of virus, although there hasn't been much movement from wild mammals back into poultry, uh, but it's probably not impossible. And the reason we say that now uh, is because as I'm sure you all are aware, we have had some detections in uh, quote domestic livestock, which this map, although it says domestic livestock, it's really just the states that have had affected dairy herds, dairy herds that have tested positive. Uh, there was a small um, backyard flock in Minnesota that had, I believe, had previously had infected birds and then uh, some goats on the premises ended up neurologic and tested positive for avian influenza as well. Uh, so, and here it seems that uh, there are some recent layer farms in, I think, especially Michigan and maybe in Texas, that preliminary epi reports suggest that maybe the virus had moved from infected dairy cattle back to the poultry and not vice versa. So, it does show that, you know, it, we could potentially have some other additional sources of AI uh, in these livestock that could get back into our poultry. And, and a lot of this could have probably been prevented with biosecurity and particularly keeping wild birds away from livestock facilities as much as possible. So I think it does it just further points how important biosecurity in these practices should be. And if that still really hasn't sold everybody as to why we need to keep talking about this, uh, another reason is that people are just becoming more and more interested in where their food comes from, which I'm sure you all, all feel that as well. And so people are interested in having their own birds, having birds in their backyard or small flocks, and they want birds for a number of reasons. So this study is a few years outdated, but I like to show this slide when I when I have this topic, uh, just to show that you know there are a good number of people in the U.S. that have or were planning to have chickens, and it probably is higher than that by now uh, because this was this study was also done before COVID, and during COVID it seemed there were some spikes in in bird ownership. And so they obviously keep them mostly uh, to use for food for home use but other people just like to keep them as pets or, or for a number of reasons. And unfortunately, a lot of these people that get birds don't often know much about the birds themselves, but they really don't know much about biosecurity. And so we really need veterinarians uh, and, and people with a focus on food safety and public health to help educate these people on proper biosecurity management and husbandry. Okay. So I hope that background kind of helps set up why uh, we need to keep discussing this. And, and so now I'd like to get into just some specific recommendations uh, or, you know, some of them are, are generic, but some are, are fairly specific. And so I, I'm starting with one that I think is probably the most important. Uh, and, and I will talk about later uh, some information from USDA that helps prove that, that this is really quite essential. And so first we'll talk about this line of separation concept or LOS. And this is a line which truly is, is meant to separate poultry from potential disease sources. And this line can be, you know, either the actual walls of the building, fences, other, um, it's just some clear demarcation um, from the outside to the inside. And so anyone or anything that's crossing the line must take appropriate precautions. So this includes people um, making sure that we're, you know, changing boots or disinfecting shoes and disinfecting hands disinfecting any tools or equipment that has to come over that line. And then if it is, you know, some sort of mixed species situation or uh, it's a small flock and they're bringing birds into the flock, making sure that animals are quarantined and following specific biosecurity procedures before they're allowed to cross that line. And so this photo is just an example of a, a small um, breeder flock house that did have a little bit of an entryway into the building. And so you could probably just set up that line of separation at the actual door itself uh, if you had enough space on the other side. But the way that this entryway was, uh, it was a little bit easier to just um, use some tape and really mark a line of separation in that entryway there. And so you would walk in, you could disinfect your, your shoes um, with the disinfectant mat, but then you would still take off your, your outdoor shoes and put on some indoor shoes as you step over that piece of tape. Um, so it's, you know, basically just a cheap type of Danish entry. Uh, it'd probably be a little bit easier with a bench, but some of these spaces are fairly small and, and not conducive to that. So it can be as simple as a piece of tape. It's important to remember, though, that, of course, this and, and everything else we will talk about today is a reduction of risk. It's not a total elimination, uh, and it would be 
essentially impossible to totally eliminate these risks. So just need to do what we can to eliminate or uh, to reduce that risk and, and hopefully, you know, reduce the chances of walking something into the house. And so I get told a lot that this is a really difficult concept uh, not easy to implement in smaller backyard flock situations, but I would encourage everybody to, to kind of rethink that and to discuss that with these types of clients and producers uh, and, and really just try to think uh, if there's some sort of line of separation you could implement. And it, it won't be perfect, but it's still something to help reduce that risk. And so here's just an example. I pulled some pictures from online, some kind of backyard or small flock coop setups. <clears throat> excuse me. And this one in, in, in this example does have some sort of fence around this area. So you could say that, that your line of separation is that fence. And yes, the birds are kept outside and they're still exposed to a lot of things, but you can make sure that you are not the one who's walking things into these birds. So changing your shoes or putting on um, some coveralls and, and all of that, you know, dedicated PPE uh, making sure that you're putting that on before you enter this actual bird area would definitely help you reduce the risk and could be considered your line of separation. And similarly here, so this is another little coop setup, uh, and it looks like in this case, the birds actually don't really have access to the grass or anything outside of their coop. So uh, you could easily, you know, consider this, this entryway, this door, your line of separation, and maybe keep um, some shoes and some coveralls and a tote or something nearby that you could change into right before you walk into that, that coop. Next and, and possibly most important is uh, the concept of visitors. And we really need to keep visitors to a minimum. Um, visitors can be a big risk. This does include, when we're thinking of small backyard type scenarios, it does also include family and friends, which sometimes is a hard sell for those folks. Ideally, if, if you do have to have visitors, uh, you know, this could include things like contractors or other people coming to work on buildings as well. Uh, you want to make sure that they sign in and that you have uh, kept a log or, or kept track of who has been on your farm and when, what they were doing, and that they actually did follow those biosecurity rules. And so in some smaller backyard flock situations, been able to sell this by trying to make it a more cute concept and say, you know, it's a guest book of everybody who's ever come to visit your birds, which hopefully it's not a very big book. Um, but it does, you know, if you explain to them that if your birds were to become sick with anything, uh, it would be good to be able to trace uh, who has been there. And if they visited any birds afterwards, that could be at risk. But again, it's important if you do have visitors, they have to all follow those biosecurity rules. Uh, and ideally visitors, you know, you want to ask them some questions. So do they have their own birds? Where have they been? Uh, have they been to a feed store, pet store, zoo, other places that could be risky and have birds that could be carrying all sorts of diseases? And so ideally, if people have their own birds or have been to a risky place, you don't let them in contact with your birds or, or into the, onto the premises. Any visitors that come on have to follow any biosecurity rules, of course, and most importantly would be to wash their hands and change their shoes, make sure they're not bringing anything in from the outside. Owners, uh, they also need to follow their own rules. So whether, you know, this is a producer with a large flock uh, or a small backyard flock owner, uh, they have to follow their own rules as well. They're not above it. And that, you know, same goes, people always say that about the uh, president or CEOs of companies at, at large facilities. Uh, they are not above these biosecurity rules either. Everyone must follow the rule. And so the biggest one, of course, is don't visit other flocks. Uh, or if you do have to visit other flocks, you follow the appropriate downtime recommendations. And uh, it's important to consider that hunting is, is pretty risky, especially waterfowl, wild birds. So a lot of larger companies have rules about that. If you do hunt, that you have to have a specific amount of downtime before you come back. And so I would say the same, you know, for small backyard flock producers to keep that in mind. And then of course, limit any visits to feed store, pet stores use, as we'd already kind of mentioned. If you do need to go to those places, because of course, sometimes you do uh, try to visit at the end of the day or send someone else who doesn't have to have direct contact with the birds. And otherwise, you know, once you have visited those places, definitely take a shower, change clothes and shoes before you return to the flock. Farm dedicated clothing and shoes. Uh, this is also, you know, a really big one. And sometimes with small backyard flocks, a bit difficult to sell as well. Uh, but ideally, we have a separate set of clothing or coveralls and footwear or shoe covers before working with birds. We don't want to bring our street shoes and clothes in. Uh, they could be, you know, super contaminated with, we only know what. Uh, and so these are 
things that are only used when working with the flock. If you are using cloth coveralls, these of course have to be washed frequently. And so, you know, disposable items are preferable, but also difficult. You know, they can be expensive and, and to continue to replace those can get expensive. And then of course, hairnets and hats, we definitely use those on, on the commercial side as you can get dander, feathers, other things stuck in your hair that you then carry with you to other sites or off the farm or what have you. Uh, but yeah, I would argue that that's important to try to get some, you know, the small and backyard type producers to use as well. They could just as easily uh, walk away with something in their hair or bring something in in their hair. Uh, if we're doing this, we also need to try to help these people uh, organize their farm dedicated clothing and shoes to make it easier for them so they are more likely to comply with this type of biosecurity protocol. Ideally, these um, items are stored near the entry to the bird area as close as possible or as, you know, right near that line of separation so that you can be sure to change out of your dirty clothes and into your nice clean flock clothes and enter the, the um, bird area. They should be kept in a waterproof, pest-proof area or container. We don't want that to become contaminated at all. Uh, that would then defeat the purpose. You have to make it as easy to access as possible uh, and as close to that line of separation as possible. And it has to be as easy to put on or, or as, as easy as possible. As we'd, uh, I'd shown in that photo on, on the line of separation slide, it'd be nice to have a bench or a chair or something available for support. It makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but biosecurity is inconvenient. Um, so, you know, if we can try to make it as convenient as possible, that will definitely help with compliance. But uh, it's, not, it's not going to be super easy to do these things, but we should want to do them anyways. Hand and feet sanitation, uh, like we've talked about already a few times, definitely want to wash hands before and after handling birds. Uh, ideally, we're using soap and water actually washing our hands, but hand sanitizer at, a, at an entry to a bird area um, would be great, if nothing else. You want to don disposable boot covers or use disinfectant foot baths. Uh, disposable boot covers or, you know, dedicated shoes are definitely preferred as foot baths are hard to maintain, but we can still talk about foot baths here in a second. Uh, and then, of course, want to remove that organic material first. As we all know, you can't disinfect dirt. So have to remove that material before the actual disinfectant step and consider contact time as well, which is why foot baths can be a little bit difficult to manage, I think. Uh, but a lot of places do still implement them and it does still probably help reduce risk a little bit. Foot baths have to be changed regularly. Uh, they will not be effective if soiled. So that, that can be difficult. And as we just mentioned, you need to make sure that we remove organic material with a brush before stepping into that disinfectant to make sure that it is as effective as possible. Uh, there are a variety of disinfectants available. I think diluted liquid bleach or bleach powder are what's most commonly used. Um, a lot of people in industry are not necessarily a fan of the bleach powder. Don't know that it actually really does anything. Uh, it does just seem to be that it's the easiest, most convenient thing to do. But then you'd have to, you know, think about if it is really actually adding any value or not. So I would argue that dedicated shoes to change into or wearing um, shoe covers would be preferred when possible. Cleaning and disinfection, a pretty big topic, uh, and it is a, a multi-step process, definitely. Um, there are really great resources from USDA available on each of these biosecurity points, really, but um, this one in particular, they have a really nice checklist for cleaning and disinfecting poultry enclosures that can be modified to fit both, you know, commercial use and then for smaller backyard type flocks. And so we always need to stress this is a multi-step process. First, we need to dry clean, remove any organic material before we wash with soap and water, rinse, be sure to let things air dry so that we're not diluting disinfectant when it's applied apply the disinfectant and allow the contact time to um, actually do its thing and reduce the pathogen load. And so, yeah, I would encourage you to check out these resources if you have not before or weren't familiar with them. They're um, really a nice way to help a producer build a biosecurity plan. Along with cleaning and disinfection tools and equipment, ideally we have dedicated tools and equipment whenever possible, which means we're not sharing with our neighbors, especially with other bird owners. Uh, if we, um, you know, especially if we're sharing, hopefully we're not, but especially if we are, tools and equipment need to be clean and disinfected before use. Uh, they should be clean and disinfected after use as well. And then stored inside somewhere where they can't be accessed by pests or be contaminated in some other way. 
If external services, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, any contractors have to visit the farm, they have to follow biosecurity rules. That not only includes the PPE and, you know, hand and, and foot sanitation, but if they have to bring any tools or equipment or anything else on the farm, it must be clean and disinfected according to those biosecurity procedures as well. Vehicles, similarly, um, first of all, if we could limit visits to some of those risky places, that would help um, reduce possible risk with vehicles, um, reduce the chances that our vehicles are contaminated with a pathogen that we could then drive up close to the farm. Uh, if you drive past another flock, and this is, you know, particularly aimed toward those smaller backyard flock folks, if they drive past another backyard flock or even some waterfowl, uh, ideally we get a, a car wash before going home. And the tires and undercarriage are most important. Um, and a lot of commercial farms do have um, vehicle steps required, whether it is a, you know, like a tire disinfectant before coming onto the farm, or if you drive over one of those um, disinfectant bars that will get a little bit of the undercarriage as well. Um, and this is especially right now with the high risk, with even influenza, um, we definitely consider tire disinfectant at the end of driveways, even for small or backyard flocks. So just trying to reduce the chances that you are, are bringing anything back home with you uh, that you could then walk into, into the bird area. And for some of those smaller situations, garden sprayers work fairly well. You can get a, a cheap gallon pump sprayer from Home Depot for about $11. So it's not perfect, but it definitely, it, it should help um, reduce any load that's there. Feed, litter, and water. Um, we wanna make sure we store feed and litter in waterproof and rodent-proof containers um, for obvious reasons. If there are feed water spills, um, definitely look, check for those each day, clean those up as they occur to reduce um, attracting any pests to the area. Big, big one for avian influenza, of course, is to keep wild birds away from water or feed sources. So if, if wild birds have access to those, they can easily contaminate those. And that's often thought to be how a lot of these backyard or, or small flocks have been infected, is co-mingling with wild birds, especially waterfowl. And then covered water sources are best when possible. And, you know, in a commercial setting, this is typically much easier. If we're thinking about smaller backyard flock settings, they do have different equipment available, such as in the photo here. Uh, in which this is actually a nice covered bucket, but it has um, nipples at the at the bottom of the bucket for the birds to access. So fairly clean, closed water system, even for a smaller backyard flock scenario. Pests, also a really big one, especially right now with avian influenza. Uh, while birds, rodents, cats, uh, probably others, pose a huge disease risk, we have seen, um, especially recently, cats that become neurologic and die on, on poultry farms that are testing positive for even influenza. We used to think cats, and well, we still do, cats are still a risk for other things, especially we think about um, Pestrella multocida, the bacteria that causes foul cholera. But in addition to that, now we have to worry about AI. Um, with wild birds, um, rodents, whatever, uh, it's not just the animals themselves, but any anything from those animals, feathers, nests, feces, et cetera. And we really need to keep those out as much as possible. And as we just talked about, that includes protecting feed and water and where possible avoiding the use of surface water as that's probably very contaminated. And, and there've been reports coming back to of wastewater um, with uh, detections of AI. Um, so definitely wanna be careful with any, any source of water. Clean up feed spills to reduce attracting those pests and then possibly consider using wild bird deterrents. So commercial sites are getting more into using lasers and, and other things like that, um, which are a bit more expensive, but do seem to be fairly effective. Otherwise, if we're thinking about smaller backyard scenarios or just looking for something a bit cheaper, there are other options. Uh, it's just that, you know, if you use these um, fake owls or other things like that, they do have to be moved around from time to time as the wild birds will get used to them. Uh, they won't be scared of them and they'll still come in and show up and nest and roost and whatever. So if we do use those, we need to make sure we're moving them around and, and really taking a look at where those birds are hanging out and trying to knock down any nests and, and things of that nature. Waste disposal. This will be a bit different depending uh, um, on what state or even, you know, what county or township you're in. Uh, but this is also something that small and backyard flock producers don't necessarily think about when they get birds. Uh, you will have mortality, litter, manure, and feed that has to be disposed of. Uh, and, and burial does seem to be most common in smaller backyard situations or people end up just bagging up that waste and sending it to landfill. Um, 
you do need to make sure that you have an understanding of what's allowed in the state and especially in, in that local area. So definitely check state and local regulations because the owner would be liable for disposal if it's done incorrectly or, or something happens there. And um, so I, here in Pennsylvania, we have specific rules uh, and, and Penn State Extension has this great article on livestock and poultry mortality disposal. So again, it would be different depending on where, where you live, but I think this is a great resource that talks about the different options and what we can do here in PA. Uh, and then has some contact information as well. So definitely if you're not sure about this or if you have clients, producers, or, or whoever asking you questions um, to get them the appropriate information through their Department of Ag um, or Extension offices. If they are considering adding to a flock, uh, and again, this is typically more of a, a smaller backyard flock type thing, but obviously we have large multi-age sites in the commercial industry as well. Ideally, flocks are all in, all out, but this is not usually realistic. If you are going to add to a flock, they have to be from a reputable source, which includes, you know, NPIP certified sources, making sure that they are clean of specific pathogens. Uh, and then if it's a smaller backyard flock scenario, ideally they get their birds from mail order hatcheries, which are places that are also sometimes NPIP certified, but they have the ability to apply day of hatch vaccines, which for a smaller backyard flock, it's really important that we stress to them that they get that Merrick's disease vaccine. Want to quarantine any new additions? If we are adding to the flock, they should be quarantined for at least 30 days. And this is where we check, especially for respiratory signs or any parasites. When we are adding birds, we want to make sure we combine birds of similar sizes to prevent bullying. So birds will peck uh, and try to establish that hierarchy. When we are adding to a flock or any other time, we definitely want to monitor for signs of illness. And so if we're adding to a flock in particular, you really want to make sure you have a quarantine pen or area prepared ahead of time. Uh, and ideally this, you know, especially goes for illness too. You want to have that prepared before you have sick birds and would need it. This should be an area where there's low foot traffic to reduce any spread from the sick birds back to healthy birds. It should be as far away from the remainder of birds as possible. And so USDA recommends a minimum of 30 feet. And ideally, uh, we also have dedicated equipment for sick birds that is separate from what's used for the other healthy birds. When we are quarantining and monitoring for signs of illness, um, this box just gives a, a general list of some signs of illness. Uh, definitely want to keep an eye out for these things and encourage clients and producers to reach out to their veterinarians if they are seeing any of these things. Uh, when we're quarantining, again, it's at least for 30 days. We do have sick birds. We want to make sure that we care for those birds last. So move from healthy to sick uh, and ideally from young to old. If we are dealing with sick birds, we want to encourage and, and educate clients and producers that they report that immediately, uh, particularly significant mortality. And so that's for obvious reasons. If they might be dealing with even influenza, we want to notify the state veterinarian's office as soon as possible. If for some reason uh, we can't get a hold of the state veterinarian's office or, um, you know, you have clients in another state and you're not sure who to tell them to contact, there is also a USDA toll-free hotline that can be used and they will get you in contact with the right people in the right state. When dealing with multi-age flocks, which again, ideally we're, we're not doing that, but that's, you know, almost never the case uh, so we are dealing with multi-age flocks in a lot of scenarios. It is difficult for several reasons, obviously biosecurity, which is why we're talking about this today, but it can be difficult from a nutrition standpoint and just a general management standpoint as well. Uh, so when we're working with multi-age flocks, like I had said, definitely want to care for birds from youngest to oldest if possible. Ideally, we aren't mixing birds as we are in this photo here um, with adults and young chicks. We want to keep birds separate until they are you know, at least of a similar size to avoid that, um, any aggression. Thinking about multi-species flocks, similarly, flocks are ideally all the same species uh, because similarly, if they're not, it is difficult to manage from a biosecurity, nutrition, and, and general disease standpoint. Uh, but again, especially from a smaller backyard flock standpoint, a lot of times they do have mixed flocks. If they're going to do that, though, there are still some recommendations to try to reduce risk, which would be to keep gallinaceous birds, which are chickens, turkeys, separate from waterfowl. So unlike what we see here. Uh, and that's, again, you know, for things like avian influenza, especially. Commingling of turkeys with chickens is also not recommended, though, uh, because chickens carry that sequel worm that carries Histomonas meleagridis, which is the causative uh, agent of blackhead 
which in chickens is not usually a big deal, but when it gets into turkeys, it can cause pretty significant mortality. So, um, you know, if you get a call that says, I have chickens and turkeys and my chickens are fine, but all the turkeys are dead, uh, definitely want to test them for AI, make sure that it's not AI, but it's most likely going to be blackhead. So we like to try to recommend that they keep those birds separate or, or ideally they don't have both chickens and turkeys. Uh, and now, you know, we'll talk about in a few slides too, we have to consider other species, not just bird species, uh, but what to do if there are other species on the site like goats or, or cattle. And I did just want to take a second and say a lot of these recommendations, you know, they're they're pretty tried and true and they're things that we've been doing in the industry for a long time. Uh, but I know that it can be a hard sell, especially for smaller backyard clients. But, you know, in addition to what we've seen in industry and, and that those things actually work, there is a, uh, I guess it's not super recent now, hopefully USDA will come out with it an updated EPI report shortly. But the um, USDA released their HPAI EPI report uh, in 2023, and it showed that um, some data from their case control studies using commercial flocks, but it still probably does apply to smaller flocks, they demonstrated that factors associated with an increased risk of avian influenza infection included being in an existing control zone, which we can't really do much about, but that's uh, an obvious risk. But then the other ones, you know, include sightings of wild waterfowl, moving vegetation less than four times per month, having off-site mortality disposal, and then allowing wild birds access to feed or feed ingredients, which, you know, so if we um, are able to avoid these things, we could definitely decrease our risk of infection with AI and most likely a lot of other pathogens as well. And they found that some of the protective factors included some of, you know, the recommendations we've talked about already, like high level of vehicle washing prior to entering a farm, uh, having designated personnel assigned to specific barns or, you know, specific flocks or birds, having a farm entrance gate, and then requiring a change of clothing um, prior to entering barns. Again, I know it is probably a harder sell for backyard or small flocks, but this does just help prove and emphasize the importance of biosecurity and sanitation when it comes to preventing these high consequence diseases and that we really, we do these things for a reason and, and that they do seem to work and have a protective effect. So if you are seeing poultry, if you're working in a clinic setting, you're seeing poultry or you're considering seeing poultry, um, there are you know, some biosecurity recommendations and things that veterinarians specifically should be considering. That includes physical separation of those patients. If you are seeing birds at a clinic, ideally you would admit them to isolation or a separate contained space. Uh, you can maybe potentially examine them outside if that's a possibility uh, to keep them from coming in and, and potentially contaminating the clinic. You want to limit contact with them, you know, both from a, a human standpoint as well. Uh, try to schedule these appointments carefully. Uh, wear appropriate PPE, wash, sanitize hands. Some of that, you know, should be basic stuff, but it's important to remember to do so. If you have birds into the clinic, immediately clean, disinfect that area afterwards. And again, you know, the goal would be to reduce the risk of disease transmission as much as possible. And when we're talking about that risk, we're really thinking about HPAI right now. And so, you know, if you're seeing poultry, the possibility of transmission of HPAI to people, uh, that risk is still thought to be low at this point. So hopefully that's not deterring you from seeing birds. Um, you know, transmission to mammals, medium, may be high at this point. So that's why I would say, it, you know, try to keep birds away from the other uh, patients that you have in your clinic. And obviously transmission to other birds is high. So you want to try to triage poultry cases if you are a clinic that is accepting those. Uh, so when, when you hopefully get a call from somebody and um, or somebody shows up, you want to see if the bird is demonstrating signs compatible with AI, ask them if there are other birds in the flock that are sick or have died, uh, or if AI has been detected in the surrounding area. Those should all be kind of red flags for you. Uh, if for some reason an animal does end up testing positive for AI, and it had been in the clinic, at that point, state public health veterinarians will help determine how best to proceed as far as C&D, dead bird disposal, and, and all those sorts of things. If you're a veterinarian who plans to do farm visits, before doing any sort of farm visit, uh, even if you're not, you know, going to purposefully visit poultry, you want to ask if there are poultry on the premises. Uh, and so then you can still take appropriate precautions and make sure you're not dragging anything to the poultry accidentally. So that includes your PPE, hand sanitation, etc. If you are purposefully visiting flocks, you want to have adequate downtime between visits, which I would say should be at least 72 hours, especially when dealing with small backyard flocks that are often carriers of diseases like mycoplasma or coryza. And again, if you do happen to deal somehow with an, you know, an HPAI positive flock or one that's demonstrating uh, 
signs consistent with that, you want to have downtime of up to one week or longer per the state vet or whatever recommendations are in, in your state. Uh, if a client or a producer calls you, you're dealing with dead wild birds or neurologic birds or, or whatever that could be a risk, not only to their poultry, but you know, to goats if they have those on the premises or, or dairy cattle. Uh, you want to contact the appropriate state or regional game commission office uh, or USDA Wildlife Services. And they can help figure out what to do with those birds if they need tested or how to dispose of them. Uh, but so, of course, this is really essential to consider right now. If you are doing other livestock visits, too, I would consider downtime as much as possible, especially with the current state of AI in dairy herds. With that, just some take-home points. Um, they're pretty basic again, but I think it's important. Biosecurity is obviously essential. We want to keep outside out and inside in whenever possible. Biosecurity is unique and it should be. Biosecurity plans are not one size fits all. So, you know, we talked about a lot of different scenarios here with small backyard or large commercial sites, multi-age, multi-species. So these things have to be taken into account when creating a biosecurity plan. And biosecurity is often inconvenient. If it's too easy, it probably doesn't work, but something is better than nothing. And there, I just have a couple of slides with some um, resources, which you will have access to these slides. And I can I can send additional resources if you have specific questions as well. Uh, and so obviously USDA Defend the Flock has a lot of great materials. Uh, and so the QR codes will take you there, but then later you, you'll have these clickable links as well. And then obviously I'm at Penn State. And so we do have a pretty great um, extension service here, poultry extension team. They have a lot of poultry health and care articles and videos available at this website um, that could certainly work in other states, but you know, other states have great extension services as well. Uh, if you are um, uh, interested uh, and learning more about poultry or, you know, haven't worked much with poultry, or even if you have, uh, the, there is a poultry medicine course for veterinarians in private practice that I would encourage you, even if you are not in private practice, to share with um, the veterinarians you work with. Uh, this is put together by the American Association of Avian Pathologists, or AAAP. It consists of 22 modules, and it does um, account for eight hours of race-approved CE, so I've heard really great things about it. You know, the people who put this course together, and, and I'm sure it's great. You can also access the AAAP Avian Disease Manual 7th edition for free online at this link. And then if you are working more with the small or backyard type um, situations, this is a great textbook um, to have. Here are some references that I use putting this together. And I would just like to take a chance to thank everybody. Um, my team here at Penn State, um, my colleague, Dr. Megan Lighty, she helps me put these presentations together. And then we have a resident, Dr. Jonathan Elisa, uh, and he will be taking up a role um, in the state of Washington as um, Washington State University's um, poultry pathologist um, this summer. Uh, of course, the Penn State Poultry Extension Team for all of the materials that I've mentioned in this talk, ACVPM and the Food Safety and Public Health Veterinary Group for having me, and then the AVMA as well. Um, and as I had mentioned, I'll be presenting this at AVMA and then USH again. So I'd love to meet up with you all if, if you'll be there. And I'm going to put in a little plug too. I chair the um, Poultry Committee for USHA. So if you're not involved with that and you're interested in that, I uh, would definitely love to have you there. So thank you all so much for listening today. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, obviously we can take those now, uh, but if you would like to get a hold of me later, you can um, send me an email. So thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Neal, for that uh, very timely and engaging presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions, but before we do that, I'm gonna allow you to catch your breath and get a sip of water if you if you uh, uh, need one. Uh, Couple of administrative announcements, just uh, to repeat what uh, we said at the at the first of the presentation. Uh, first of all, our CE certificates will be sent out uh, approximately seven to 10 days from now. I've been getting them out in approximately a week, so expect it closer to seven than 10 days. Uh, the recording of today's presentation uh, will be posted to the ACVPM YouTube page, uh, again, in approximately a week or so. Uh, if there are any phone callers, uh, again, once uh, again, I ask you that uh, if you email me so I can link your name with a telephone number, email me what phone number you use to dial in at ACVPM. I'm sorry, it's been a short morning or long morning already. Email me at admin at ACVPM.org. Again, just send me an email, say, I dialed in, the phone number I used was this. 
and I'll get you link your name and your telephone number linked up. Uh, so with that, uh, we can move to a few questions. We've got several of them. Um, uh, first question is regarding uh, HPAI and the dairy cattle. And uh, the question is uh, whether you have any thoughts on whether HPAI and dairy cattle is from poultry or wild birds or potentially both. And can HPAI go from dairy cattle back to poultry or to wild birds? Again, I think those are the big questions right now. Uh, I think some of the preliminary information that we have, some of the preliminary epi information does suggest that um, the cattle have been infected from wild birds. But I think that there have been, of course, questions too that that maybe it has come from poultry as well. Uh, to this point, and to my knowledge, it's that the the data is pointing that it, it is introduction from wild birds into cattle. And of course, that could change, uh, and that it has not um, it has not spread from cattle or from poultry to cattle, but it it has likely spread from cattle to poultry. But again, I think this uh, the situation is changing every day, so it is. It's hard to say, and I, I wouldn't want to hang my hat on anything, but um, the preliminary epi suggests that it's from wild birds on those dairy sites that have been infected. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, whether you have any biosecurity su suggestions for small industry, uh, pasture raised or fed flocks. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of the things we talked about, I know it's a, a a bit of a different scenario there, um, but a lot of the things we, we talked about could be modified um, to fit those types of flocks as well. And again, it would just be things, we're doing things to reduce the risk of introducing them to disease. And so you don't have as much control over pasture raised birds. Uh, but, you know, I think again, it, too, it's a kind of a case by case scenario. So I don't know if I have anything specific. It'd be uh, interesting to see if, if you are working with some of those clients, what their setups are, if they have you know, any ability to at least bring birds in at night or different things like that, or um, if they are truly pasture all the time, and especially right now, you know, that's a, a fairly big risk with wild birds. So that would be the biggest recommendation is, is trying to keep them away from wild birds and especially waterfowl. All right, excellent. Um, do you have any recommendations on protocols for effective disinfection of wood, dirt, grass, other organic or natural surfaces? Yeah, it'd be nice if we did have something that could truly disinfect those things, but um, we don't really. And so, you know, if you're if you're considering things like a, a pasture raised flock or something like that, you know, trying to rotate that pasture that they're on, uh, reducing exposure that way. Uh, if there are a lot of wooden materials, um, there are some disinfectants that maybe have a claim to work. Um, with a higher organic load. So those might be ones to consider, but again, it's it's something that won't be perfect and it would just be trying to reduce risk as much as possible. So um, yeah, again, another kind of case by case basis. Uh, it'd be interesting to see some of these other scenarios that maybe you guys are working with too. Um, and so you can definitely reach out to me later and I can try to talk some specifics if there are specific questions. All right, uh, we have a question here in the chat. Um... Some animal shelters accept poultry species for adoption to other backyard flock owners. What advice would you have for health assessments of those birds, testing, for example, isolation or quarantine period at the shelter, and any other suggestions for adopting those types of birds out? Yeah, those are really difficult scenarios, but we definitely deal with that here in PA. Uh, and it does kind of depend to what the capabilities of probably the local labs are as far as testing goes. Um, a lot of times sending that testing out does get fairly expensive too, if it's not within state. Uh, so I would consider, of course, um, screening everything for um, AI, um, paramyxovirus or NDV. Uh, and then, you know, depending on the type of bird as well, um, there would be some additional recommendations. And most of those would be some of those respiratory diseases that they can carry, but don't necessarily show clinical signs of disease. Um, so again, maybe a wishy-washy answer, but kind of case by case, um, depending on the, the species of bird, um, there would be a number of pathogens to test for isolation or quarantine. Again, I would still recommend that at least 30 days to, to monitor them for signs of disease and make sure that you get those negative test results back before moving the birds out of quarantine and adopting them out. And I would also, you know, be interested in, in, 
uh, some of these shelters do have this in place. I don't think all, but, you know, kind of questionnaires for those potential owners as well and what kind of birds they already have on their premises and what familiarity they have um, with that type of species and what possible diseases to be concerned about. So um, kind of considering what happens to those birds after they leave as well and if they could potentially be exposing other birds on that premises. All right. And then the final question we have is uh, whether you have any suggestions for biological monitoring, uh, possibly indicator organisms to evaluate effectiveness of your biosecurity measures. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when we talk about that, we're mostly considering like commercial um, premises. But so uh, and it does depend a little bit to whether, you're, you know, you're thinking of we talk mostly today about like the farm itself, but if it's a hatchery too, or a processing plant or things like that. Um, but so if we're thinking of like a commercial um, flock in a farm setting, um, we would definitely test for a number of organisms. So like in my, in my previous life, um, we did a lot of salmonella monitoring. So um, boot swabs, nest boxes, um, things like that. And then um, we would also just take some general um, um, bacterial plates and air plates at the farm as well um, to check for both, um, you know, just any any CFUs we could find or um, fungus. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that I have, I um, guess it, it depends on exactly what you're looking for. And, and if it's a, a hatchery situation too, um, you could do similar things, you know, like actual touch plates, even of eggs. And um, a lot of times there, uh, we would just look for general um, enteric bacteria, um, but typically a lot of times from the poultry side too, we'll look at just general salmonella as well. But it, it's again, another thing that's kind of case by case. So I don't know if I have specific recommendations. Um, there are obviously specific recommendations for things when it comes to processing plants. Um, but yeah, in this scenario, you know, different touch plates, air plates, looking at enteric bacteria and fungus. All right, excellent. Uh... That pretty much uh, completes our questions. We did have a, uh, a link posted to our webinar chat session. Uh, Dr. Castle posts a link for the APHIS USDA uh, website on livestock poultry disease uh, and HPAI detection in livestock. Uh, so that's a, a valuable link for our attendees. So we've reached our hour. Uh, so as you head to the AVMA, Dr. Neal, you know your presentation is, is about an hour long with questions. So I uh, uh, want to thank everybody for their attendance. I definitely want to thank Dr. Neal for her uh, very uh, engaging presentation on a, 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 this timely topic. Uh, uh, the ACVPM cannot do this C webinar program without volunteers like Dr. Neal. So if you're interested in presenting, or if you know someone that uh, you feel would be a great presenter, have them email. You can email me or have them email me at admin at acvpm.org. And we can get you linked up with our continuing education committee and get you on the schedule. Uh, also put a plug in for the uh, AVMA convention coming up in Austin, Texas in, in June. And Dr. Neal mentioned that she's a speaker. The American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, uh, American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, and other uh, public health corporate practice type of organizations have a block of instruction uh, during that, that uh, AVMA convention. So seek those sessions out if you're interested in public health, One Health, and other uh, public health topics. And then finally, uh, for those that are not ACVPM diplomates, our American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine application period will open for the 2025 board certification exam. It will open on 1 June, uh, so just in a few weeks. Uh, go to our website if you're interested in uh, possibly joining as a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. So everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you again for your attendance and uh, look out for our next webinar, which will likely be in July. We are not doing a webinar in June due to the AVMA convention, uh, but look for an invitation coming out mid June or so for a July webinar. Thanks and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>